So welcome, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining. I am uh, Michael Skargakis. I've been working in Red Hat for uh, four years. And uh, during the past year, I've been part of um, the OpenShift on Azure team. And um, together with uh, the Microsoft team, on the other side, we've been building uh, OpenShift on Azure. Um, and you know the, the goal of this presentation, uh, and after you leave this uh, room, I want you to have a good grasp of uh, what, uh, what the service that we are building is. Um, a quick uh, walkthrough through the agenda. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the service. Uh, the user experience, uh, I'm going to walk you through. Note that it's still, uh, most of it is still a work in progress, especially the portal stuff. Um, I'm go we're going to dive into the architecture of uh, the product. Um, and there's, there are going to be some terms, uh, Azure or OpenShift related, uh, I'm going to explain them. I'm going to uh, touch briefly on our integrations that we have uh, in OpenShift with Azure. Uh, the teams, of course, that put the effort uh, be, uh, behind bringing the service into the market. Uh, the support that we are going to offer to our customers. Uh, rough timelines and a couple of references for you. Uh, before I get started, a quick show of hands. How many of you are familiar with OpenShift? Please raise your hands. Cool, so about four-fifths of the room. How many of you are familiar with Azure? Please raise your hands. OK, it's much less. No worries, I'm going to explain things as we go. So first, the overview. Uh, our main goals with this service is um, two things. We want um, ease of uh, use, of course, and scalability for our customers. We want to make it easy for them to stand up clusters, to manage clusters, upgrade, uh, or scale up, scale down, or even delete. And of course, uh, we want to do it in a way that is scalable, so we want to match uh, customer needs. Uh, this is the first uh, OpenShift uh, service offering in the public cloud uh, that we are offering jointly with uh, Microsoft. So the clusters are going, are going to run on uh, customer subscriptions with SLAs. Right now we are on private preview one. We offer no SLAs, but once we release this to uh, private preview two and then GA, we are going to offer SLAs. Um, Red Hat is responsible for uh, most of the workload, and that's fair because we build OpenShift, we know how to operate OpenShift. Uh, the architecture is highly opinionated, so uh, some of you already know that OpenShift is one of the most complex uh, projects, and there are lots of configurables. So we try to minimize down to a bare minimum uh, the configurables that are exposed to our customers. So it's going to be easier both for our customers to understand how they can stand up a cluster and for us to maintain if we have uh, uh, lots of different clusters with uh, as much similar configuration as possible. And we are uh, compliant with a bunch of different standards. Uh, the user experience. Um, yeah, so assuming you already have uh, logged into the Azure portal, the first thing you want to do is create a cluster. And note that the portal uh, is still a work in progress. So that's uh, the first view that you will have once uh, you create a cluster. You want to create a cluster, and you have to provide us with a couple of information, such as uh, your subscription, which I think it's going to be automatically put in there. Uh, the resource group. So how many of you are familiar with resource groups in Azure? Raise your hands. OK, so for, uh, for the rest of you, resource groups are like namespaces. You can think of them as namespaces in Kubernetes or OpenShift. Uh, so it's, it's, it, what it says, it's a group of resources um, where we are going to run your clusters inside. And then you have to provide a couple of uh, details for uh, your cluster, like uh, the name of the cluster that you want to have, uh, the region where you want to run, uh, the version of OpenShift, and also you have to provide us with the DNS uh, prefix at this point. Uh, in the future, we are going to support vanity domains. You will be also be able to configure networking. So if you have um, existing uh, networks in Azure, you will be able to reuse those and run your clusters inside those uh, networks. Uh, how how you, you will be able to view your clusters, of course, so all the cluster info. This is a, a, a list view 
of all of the clusters. As I said earlier, I we want to make it easy for customers to run lots of clusters. Uh, they may have uh, needs for uh, having their own CI clusters, their staging environments, and then their production environments. You will, all, you will be able to see this under an aggregated view. And uh, you, you also be able to see descriptions of your clusters, uh, whether uh, its status, is, uh, its deployment is successful or not, the version of uh, the OpenShift version that you are running, uh, you will be able to navigate to the web console, the OpenShift web console, uh, a couple of information about the resources that your cluster has allocated. And uh, this is still a work in progress. Uh, you will be able to view metrics, uh, alerts, and uh, logs for your clusters directly via the uh, portal. This is a work in progress both on the front end and the back end uh, at the moment. So if you need more uh, capacity, what do you do? You scale up. Uh, it's, it's going to be really intuitive. You will just have this slide bar over here, or if you want to uh, uh, put the number directly, and you just scale up, and that's it. So this is how the user experience uh, looks today in the command line. Uh, you do an OZ OpenShift create, that's already there. You provide us with uh, your resource group, uh, the name of the cluster. Uh, you also need to provide the um, location and uh, an FQDN at this point. Uh, is the OpenShift list? I think last time I tried, this is still uh, not there. Uh, is the OpenShift show for uh, showing a description of your cluster? Is the OpenShift scale? Uh, scale up your clusters. And is the OpenShift upgrade? Upgrade is, is still a work in progress. Uh, we don't allow upgrades uh, at this point in private preview one. Do you have any questions so far? Because I think right now it's demo time. Do you know uh, other Azure regions, like Azure government? So the question is if, I, if there are, we support more Azure regions like Azure government. At this point, I think um, we support a couple of regions like uh, East US, West Europe. Eventually, the plan is to support uh, also more regions like government regions and other, uh, more, more, uh, the more regions will support them better for us. And uh, it, the, the plan is to support them, yeah. Any more questions so far? You are doing good? So, I'm a CLI guy. Um, let's make it bigger. So I have started the container over here with AZ OpenShift. Uh, first thing I'm gonna do is We are looking at the resource groups in our subscription. I'm gonna create a net new resource group just to be on the safe side. I'm gonna give it the name of the resource group. The name of the cluster can be different or can be the same as the resource group, doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm gonna pass the region, the one closest to us, and an FQDN which is um, the name of the cluster. And there is also um, right now a DNS uh, prefix, that, uh, a suffix actually, that you have to, we have to uh, deploy the clusters for you. Eventually we are going to support um, vanity domains. And I think we are good to go with this. No, we're not. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, the typo. Do what do you say, typo? I don't see it. Oh, ooh. So actually, we have first to create the resource group, right? So I was doing it wrong, sorry. So first, just create the resource group where our, our, we are going to request our cluster to run, and then I have to create the actual cluster. And this is AZ OpenShift create. 
Uh, and I think that's pretty much it over here. So what happens behind the scenes? Um, so we're going to dive into the architecture right now. I'm going to try to explain what happens behind the scenes when I just uh, requested for a cluster to be created. Uh, no, no worries about the flowchart. I'm not going to go into deep details. Um, so what happens is uh, I requested a cluster, right? I just did an easy opportunity to create. Uh, behind the scenes, uh, the request ends up in a Microsoft endpoint and eventually a service behind that endpoint, which, which co we call the OpenShift resource provider, uh, is going to take care of that service, uh, that request. So the service is built by Microsoft, or more precisely, we co-develop it with Microsoft. And what we as Red Hat are doing is we develop a, a set of uh, code plugins uh, that Microsoft vendors in their service. And those code plugins, you can visualize what they are doing in the bottom of this flow chart. For example, our plugins are uh, responsible for validating the request. Um, they are also responsible uh, for uh, generating all the configuration for the cluster. So we generate all the OpenShift configurables. Um, we also generate uh, the ARM templates. How many of you are familiar with ARM templates? Stands for Azure Resource, um, uh, man uh, resource Manager Templates. And essentially, that is an accumulation of different Azure resources. For example, you have your load balancers in there. You have your VMs, which we use as scale sets. Scale sets, you can imagine them as replica sets in Kubernetes uh, or OpenShift. Um, so we generate all of the configurations. Once we have the ARM template, we pass it to Microsoft. And Microsoft will deploy it for us. And once everything is up and running, all the VMs are up. We have a, a bunch of, we have actually two, start, two startup scripts, one for masters and one for uh, all the other nodes. And when masters come up, uh, the one API server, one controller manager, and then one etcd instance is going to run inside the, each master VM. So masters come up. Uh, the no, from, from the node uh, side, nodes uh, just run a kubelet service. Uh, and that service has a bootstrap kube config in it, so it's able to know where to find the master and ask, ask to join the cluster. So once everything is up and running, uh, magically everything joins the cluster, and eventually we run a health check, which uh, uh, everything uh, waits for everything to settle down, and once everything is up and running, it, uh, we sign off the cluster, and uh, users are able to use it. So this is how it's going to look like inside the customer subscription. The numbering of the resource groups is a bit off over here. Uh, for example, the resource group that I just created earlier is resource group number three. So a user on your right starts by having their own resource group. They request for an OpenShift cluster inside the resource group. And what happens behind the scenes is that uh, on, the, on your left side, uh, on the bottom, you have uh, the OpenShift resource provider, which is the service that we are building with Microsoft. And that service uh, creates an application, um, a managed application, which is the resource group number two. And that's, that is a way for um, a Microsoft to limit access to the customers, uh, limit customer access to Azure resources, specific Azure resources. And here we are limiting access to the cluster. So uh, users are not able to go and uh, mess with the cluster. They have limited access. <laughs> And we also have access for uh, Red Hat SREs via tooling. It's also going to be limited access. We're not, we're not going to have, for example, system, system, system admin. Um, we're going to have a predefined set of actions, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, this is how the resource group number three looks like, uh, resource group number one, sorry, which is where um, all the cluster runs, all the resources of the cluster are. We have on the top, uh, public DNS, um, we use uh, Azure DNS. Um, then we have the load balancers, one for masters and one for uh, the, the router pods for our, your applications. And uh, on the bottom, we have the private network where you have all of the different uh, machines running. You have the master nodes where we run etcd in the control plane. Uh, right now, we are, our, our architecture by default is three master nodes. We have the infra infrastructure nodes where all of the infrastructure services in OpenShift are running, uh, where we are running the Docker registry, for example, the router pods. And then we have the application nodes um, that uh, users uh, are for user workloads. Uh, we are using uh, Azure Storage, of course. Um, 
we use blob storage for the Docker registry, and etcd, of course, gets SSDs. If you're familiar with etcd, it needs SSDs to work, um, because it's very, it needs lots of memory. And um, we also have, uh, of course, uh, in, in dynamic provisioning, we have uh, configured Azure disks for uh, customers. So customers, by default, they also get SSDs. Okay, let's have a look in my demo. It's still running. So I'm going to touch briefly on the integrations, uh, which I already have started doing. Uh, we have on the top DNS and uh, load balancers from Azure. We are using uh, AAD, which stands for uh, Azure Active Directory for the Azure authentication. Right now, it's the only um, way how to authenticate into a cluster. In the future, we may support more uh, authentication mechanisms. Uh, we have integration with uh, the Azure Service Broker. And so you, can, you are able to request for external services, and you can access them in your cluster. Um, for metrics, uh, the plan is to use, uh, we already have actually uh, running a Prometheus and Grafana instance in the cluster, but these at the moment are not accessible for our customers to use. Eventually, I think it's going to be a self-service where customers will be able to request Prometheus with a click of a button and it's going to be deployed for them. Uh, VM scale sets is uh, what we use for uh, running VMs. Scale sets is a, new, a fairly new concept in Azure. Um, it uh, supersedes, uh, uh, um, I think it was availability sets. And uh, of course, we are using Azure Storage for both etcd, the registry, and the uh, user applications. Still running. So yeah, the, by default, your, cast, your uh, cluster gets um, DNS routing. So in your uh, web console on your left, um, you will be able to go directly to your, uh, of course, your application. You are familiar with OpenShift how it works. This is based on Azure DNS. We use an AAD. This is how it looks like in the web console. We are going to view it later on our own web console. Azure di uh, Disk uh, Dynamic Provisioning. Uh, for storage, uh, as I said earlier, SSDs by default for our customers. And before I move forward with the teams, are there any questions so far? Uh, how is, it would be handled uh, from scratch running uh, things like, for example, external operators or so? Yeah, so the question is how we are going to handle specific admin tasks like installing operators. So we are going to have um, limited access as SREs in the cluster. So all operators are going to come uh, with, uh, you know, you'll be able to install them with every new version of uh, our service. Uh, and we will also be able to, I I'm going to ha have a slide later, I'm going to explain a couple of uh, different admin tasks that we are going to have predefined for admins. So as, admin, as, ad as administrator, you are not going to be able to uh, run an operator uh, you know, while the cluster is uh, in the, during runtime. Uh, it's going to be predefined. And that's because we want to avoid you know, excessive configurables and we want to have everything under control with every version of the service that we release. So, uh, so installing an operator after the fact is uh, not a pattern we're going to follow. Any other question? When you, so, yes, so the question is um, related to cross region, if I get it correctly. Yes. 
so the question is about availability zones. I'm, I'm not really sure I understand it. Uh, whether uh, um, how OpenShift uh, takes care of uh, provisioning of different um, uh, storage in uh, different uh, across availability zones. So right now you cre you create your cluster. I, I, I'm not I don't, I'm not sure I understand your question. Right now you create your cluster in a specific region inside Azure. So. If that region is a single availability zone, then you are only able to run your, all, everything in that region. So as I said earlier, you have to provide us a region in order to create the cluster right now. So maybe you are asking about cross-region support. Yes. Yes, so everything is going to be in a single region at this point. So it's not a, it's not a high no, it's, it's, it's high availability across machines. It's not high availability across regions. Okay. As I said, I showed earlier in one, of my, in one of the requirements that you have to provide to the cluster is um, you have to provide us with a region. So you see the, the second field, you have to provide us with a region. And I passed the West Europe when I created my cluster. Yeah, but uh, you're talking about the availability zones inside the region. Mm -hmm. Because you can have a couple of them. Yeah? I think I'm not, really, I'm not really familiar with that. We can catch up while, afterwards. But I think uh, there is, uh, once you are in a region, I, 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 everything is handled automatically for you. You don't need to set up anything uh, for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really familiar with uh, Amazon, sorry. Uh, so the cluster is actually up and running. So let's go and have a look. I forgot to request uh, uh, one node. I wanted to do request just one node, but anyway. So I have to trust the certificate, of course. So the first thing you are going to see once you log into the cluster is you are getting redirected into Microsoft's Azure. This is how AAD works. So you have to give it access. And accept those permissions. And once you accept those permissions, you are getting redirected into the web console. And we are able to create um, an application right now. So now our application is up and running almost. Uh, let's go back to that. Any other questions so far? So the question is, are regarding upgrading the cluster? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to uh, touch on it later. I have a couple of, a couple of slides. Uh, but um, uh, for now, uh, the upgrades are going to be all, both user triggered. So users will be able to request to upgrade to the newer version. But we also are going to do our own uh, upgrades, for example, security uh, fixes. And uh, or key rotation, or if some, if a, if a secret uh, from, from the infrastructure is leaked. So I have a couple of slides later, which we're going to reply. Any other question? So the question is regarding wildcard certificates. So I think uh, this is something we have been discussing with Microsoft, and uh, it's, uh, it's something that we eventually will do. Yeah. It's still, uh, it's still not uh, planned, but I think uh, we have discussed it and uh, we want it eventually. Any other questions before I proceed with Teams? What is the default storage options for the cluster? So, can, can you repeat that? What is the default storage options for the cluster? The default options are for? Storage, storage okay. So it's, um, it's basically you get an Azure disk. It's a premium uh, disk that you get, which is SSD. So by default, when you do a when you request for a for a persistent volume, you just get an SSD there. I don't remember exactly um, any um, 
uh, you know, any types. Uh, and, but yeah, we can, uh, I, I can search later for that if you want a more specific answer. Any other question? Uh, so the question is whether we support auto scaling. Uh, at the moment, no. Um, but I think we may evaluate it in the future. Other questions so far? How is the network built on the nodes? The network on the nodes. So we are using uh, OpenShift SDN. Um, so yeah, once you are inside the private network of uh, Azure, we have uh, OpenShift SDN, which uh, runs there by default. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move forward with the teams here. So how we work with uh, Microsoft is uh, we have uh, a couple of different ways. We have weekly blue jeans calls where we sync up. Uh, we have our own dedicated Slack channel. Um, of course, emails, lots of emails. And we do most of our work, actually as Red Hat, we do all of our work on GitHub and out in the open. And so there's, there's a lot of back and forth in issues and pull requests. And of course, we are doing uh, occasional face-to-face uh, -face meetings, which are very helpful to move forward with uh, delivering this service. Um, currently, the teams, how they are structured, Microsoft is uh, mostly Pacific Standard Time. We are spread acro across uh, different regions, across time zones. And the reason is uh, because we are doing SRE. And uh, we want to follow the follow the sun model, uh, which is also what other companies such as Google are doing, where NSRE wakes up during normal work hours and uh, they work uh, on, uh, on this pro product. Once they go to sleep, others in a, another region pick up, another time zone, they pick up the work. And it's only working on during normal work hours. Um, so this answers your question. Uh, we are going to have uh, limited access into the cluster um, via G Geneva. Geneva is an internal uh, stack that Microsoft has for monitoring alerts, logging, and we are going to integrate with it initially at least because it's a very mature stack and it helps us a lot to kickstart this uh, service. Uh, our our uh, SREs are not going to have access to system admin for obvious reasons. And uh, we're going to offer a couple of uh, predefined uh, actions via Geneva. So as an admin, you will be able to see the cluster status. You will be able to um, rotate any kind of credentials in the cluster. Uh, you will be able to restore from backups. And you are, going to do, you are going to be able to do minor upgrades, minor updates, whether an image needs to be updated or uh, something else, a secret or whatever, you can do that. How we do development? Um, as I said earlier, GitHub. We have a couple of different uh, repos that uh, we are using. OpenShift Azure is um, the repo where we are developing uh, the production code. It's where all the code plugins that we are shipping to Microsoft are developed. And we also develop a couple of uh, custom images for our cluster. Uh, all, all are found in that repo. Then we have Azure MISC. Azure MISC is an accumulation of different SRE tools and uh, some CI-related tools as, as well. For CI, we are using uh, Prow and uh, CI Operator. Uh, that's what also the rest of the OpenShift engineering teams are using, so we're taking advantage of it. Um, and we have a lot of different uh, tests, I tell you that. Um, we are testing, uh, especially in our E2E suits, we are testing everything. We are offering us administrative tasks SD backups and restores, key rotations, scale up, scale down, upgrades. Uh, we, do, we run origin conformance. We run a couple of other uh, suits that our, our QEs uh, are, have been building on their own. Lots of different tests. Uh, let me go back to my demo. So do you guys going to scale up this cluster? Any takers? Yeah. Okay, let's spend those dollars. So uh, unfortunately, I requested my cluster to, I didn't, uh, by default, we get four uh, machines. Um, so let me prove to you that the cluster is going to be scaled because as, as an end user, I don't have access to the nodes. Actually, let's sign into the service from the command line. So 
So as an end user, I'm, I don't have access to view infrastructure uh, stuff. I, don't have, I have limited access, so I cannot view my nodes. Um, but I'm here in my namespace. I have all my pods. And you will see that uh, since we, have, we only have four nodes at the moment, two out of uh, our uh, five pods are running on the same node. Let's actually delete this build, it's annoying. So I'm going to scale up the cluster now. And unfortunately, I can, I can only go up to five. I wanted to go initially from one to five, but I'm gonna go from, from four to five. It's not that fancy, sorry. Um, I have to pass. And I think that's pretty much it, how you scale a cluster. So what happens behind the scenes is, you know, just a new VM comes up and it, it can, it's able to join the cluster as any other VM um, that we request. So apparently the build pod. So okay, let's proceed with the uh, talk. Um, yeah. How we are going to do support? Uh, initially, so let's go over through the service possibilities. Uh, everything related to cl the cluster life cycle, such as installation, upgrades, and monitoring. Upgrades actually is uh, in both uh, customers and uh, ours. But uh, most of the cluster life cycle is, uh, falls under our pur purview. Um, security upgrades as well, and support. It's going to be ours, uh, Red Hat and Microsoft. Customers, uh, they have limited access to the cluster, but they are still able to manage their own users and their own quota. And that's, uh, that, that's able, uh, they can do it because we offer them a set of custom uh, roles, custom administ administration roles, so they are able to do that. Image registry management, uh, that's uh, with uh, caveat because uh, we deploy and upgrade uh, the, the, the Docker registry as uh, SREs as a service, but um, uh, users are still responsible for uh, cleaning up their images. So image pruning uh, is still falls still under their own purview, and of course, application lifecycle and monitoring is still a customer responsibility, and then external service integration. Uh, Still, still customers. Any questions so far? So the question is whether this is going to replace AKS. Uh, probably not. Uh, well, you know, it's a different product. Uh, AKS is a Kubernetes uh, offering that Microsoft offers on their own, and this is a different service that we offer jointly with Microsoft. Any other questions? How do we manage share? So shared storage is, uh, are you asking uh, from a customer's perspective? Yeah, so the customer ordered one. How do they, they, they scale it? Yeah, so this is, uh, you, you get this all for, all for free but with, by using OpenShift. So for example, when you have a, a cluster database, you use a stateful set and you just scale up your stateful set. And your stateful set, when you scale it up, it will request more storage, so more storage will, you will get. Uh, you, the other part of your question was regarding how we do HTTP backups. Uh, shared storage backups, so our customers. So this is, uh, um, we expect this to be handled by OpenShift and the Kubernetes at some point. Uh, I know there is a snapshot API uh, and we expect that uh, it's going to be integrated into Azure. So as an end user, you will be able to say, I want to snapshot this, uh, this application. And you will, this is going to be offered by the product. It's not something that we are going to handle as a service. We expect to have it in, uh, in the product, inside the product. And the other part of your question was how we as uh, a service do backups of HD. Um, so right now we have, um, 
We, we have two different ways of uh, backup. We're doing backups. Uh, we have a cron job that runs periodically, every one hour, and takes a backup of etcd. And we are also going to be taking backups uh, before every action, uh, before every admin action. We are going to take a backup uh, of the cluster. And if something goes wrong, you can, uh, we have, a, we have a, a, a different process that is going to be exposed uh, via Geneva. And you will be able to select the backup that you want to restore. And you will just, it's going to be really simple for an administrator to do it. And uh, you will also, um, um, you will also be able, of course, to choose from different backups that I said that earlier. And something else I'm missing here. Anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm, if I remember it later, I'm gonna see. Um, any other questions? So the question is whether you can skip image pruning. Um, okay, so the question is whether you can uh, bypass, you not use uh, our registry at all. Yes, you can do that. Uh, you would have to, so, uh, so, the, so the OpenShift registry, it has this ability to work as a pass-through registry. So you can use it as a CAS of, uh, of uh, other registries. And you can still use, uh, uh, you can still use inside your pod specs uh, whatever registry you want to use. So you can, if you don't want to use uh, the internal registry, you can not use it, simply. Other questions? Okay, let's look at how the, the scale up went. Yeah, so it's there. Um, so if I go back to the web console and I scale back to four and then back to five, we should see the new port getting scheduled to the new node. No. <clears throat> okay, so um, I think it's better to probably Delete it from here because scale up and scale down is it chooses a pod in random to delete. Are there any other questions so far? So you see that the new pod lands on the new node, the fifth node. How we're going to do support? Um, so it's going to be a similar experience almost as to what our customers and Microsoft customers are dealing with today. So everything is going to start from uh, the portals, the Red Hat portal and the Microsoft uh, help for, uh, for every customer. Uh, but uh, all of them are going to, to be redirected to, redirected to a single uh, ticketing platform where they will be able to request for uh, new tickets to be opened. Uh, and there is going to be ticket exchange between uh, Microsoft and Red Hat. So uh, issues fall under uh, each one's correct, uh, you know, everyone gets the issues they have, uh, they're supposed to work on. And that's, I think, pretty much it with support. A rough timeline. So we have, uh, we had the, uh, the announcement, the, the official announcement back in the, Red Hat Summit, the last Red Hat Summit. We launched private preview uh, uh, last October. Uh, that was with no SLAs. Uh, private preview two is just around the corner. I think in private preview two we are going to start offering SLAs. I'm not really sure about that. And we are planning for uh, GA uh, by the mid of uh, this year. And a couple of references for you. Uh, on the top, you have uh, the OCP. This is the VM image that we are publishing. So as part of our service, we build the VM image, and that's what we use to, in our clusters. Um, and that's in that link over there in the marketplace, the Azure marketplace. And a couple of uh, material, at least, for, at least for private preview. Uh, all the documentation you can find in uh, the GitHub Azure OpenShift uh, repo. And there's the interest list for our customers uh, the last link. And with that, I think I can, 
open up the floor to any other questions that you may have. No more questions? So the question is whether there are plans to support KubeVirt. At this point, we have no plans. We haven't really discussed it. Uh, if uh, it's requested by our customers, and lots of customers so you know, request it, uh, we're going to add it eventually, I think. But right now, I don't think that we haven't really discussed about it. Other questions? Yes, yeah, so the question is whether there is plan to support a federation. So at this point, we just want to make it easy for customers to spin up lots of clusters. Um, they, this is a good question, actually, because if we say that uh, we want to uh, uh, offer support for different, lots of different clusters, the cluster eventually is going to request federation. Um, right now, I don't think there are any plans and the way we design our service, um, it may not be possible. I'm not really sure about it, but uh, same, uh, same replies to the previous question. If it's going to be requested, we are going to seriously consider it. More questions? So you will get all those from uh, Geneva. Okay, even things like Kubelet? Yes, yes. Eventually, everything. So if we come up with a problem, and that problem is we, we don't have information to, to how to debug this problem, what we do? We go and extend our uh, cluster status uh, action that you saw earlier. So this action over here. And eventually, it's supposed to bring uh, to have all the required information for us to debug issues. Other questions? Okay, thanks a lot for your attention, guys. And again, for me.